Okay, Success Nation, this is your host Michael Nguyen from AsianSuccessMagazine.com where successful entrepreneurs show you how to build companies and achieve success. I'm just simply thrilled to have a special guest today. He's an award-winning surgeon, a sought-after expert in facial surgery, an accomplished author and lecturer. He's uh, also a, a double board certified facial plastic surgeon and a board certified in hair restoration surgeon. He has authored five major medical textbooks. He's the 2002 winner of John Orlando Rowe Research Prize in his research on skin rejuvenation. And more recently, he has been honored as the Surgeon of the Month by the International Society of Hair Restoration Surgery. That is Dr. Sam Lam. Dr. Lam, welcome to the show. I'm honored to have you today. Thank you, Michael. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Very honored. All right. I've given our listener just a little overview about you. So take a minute and tell us about you personally. We want to get to know you and then give us an overview about your business. Sure. Yeah, I was uh, born in Hong Kong, came over to Dallas when I was three years of age, did uh, most of my education over in the East Coast. Um, and I love what I do. Um, part of what I do in terms of my professional life is I own a wellness building. It's been almost a decade now. And it's 27,000 square feet in the Plano area, Plano, Texas. And it comprises uh, my business, which is facial plastic surgery, hair restoration. Um, also have a spa here. I own a salon, Jose Abert, very, very high end. I've got tenants in the second floor. Um, a rolfer, which is a body alignment specialist, an acupuncturist a uh, uh, anti-aging doctor, a therapist, a dentist, and another plastic surgeon who specializes in non-invasive body work. So my vision is sort of a complete wellness idea. At Asian Success Magazine, we start every show with, with our guest's favorite success quote. It's our way of getting the motivation ball rolling. So Dr. Lam, what is your favorite success quote and how do you apply it, this to your everyday mentality? Sure. I have a lot of quotes, but the quote that probably comes to mind uh, is vision without action is only a dream, and action without vision is only passing time, but vision with action will change the world. And what that quote means, means to me is that a lot of people don't have much vision, so they don't know where they're going to go. And if you don't know where you're going to go, you, how are you going to get there? So you, you, know, you have to know where you want to be in one year, three years, and five years. And a really good exercise for those people that are struggling to figure out where they want to be is for them to sit down with what's called a hot pen, which means they just sit down and keep on writing everything they're thinking about, and, and they're going to come to a distillation of what's important to them over the next five years. And so you have to start with vision. You have to have a creative energy, a thought, a desire, a passion, and a drive toward a certain end. But a lot of people, they talk big. And they don't actually enact anything. So you hear a lot of people and they, 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 they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. So what's really important is to get there. And how do you get there? I believe there's a few ways to get there. One is to have great peers. I'm part of, part of an organization called Entrepreneurs Organization. So my peers are there to support me. And you have to write down your goals. And so when you write down your goals and you have accountability, then that vision is executed. For example, there was a study about 20-some years ago at Yale that – only 3% of people actually uh, wrote down their goals. And then when that 3% today, 20-some years later, own 99% of the wealth uh, compared to the rest of the class, and they're much happier based on whatever metrics you want to define that by, because they executed measurable goals, and they have goals that they have recorded in a written format. So I really believe you have to have a vision, and you have to have action, and when you have those things, what I mean by changing the world is making an impact that is favorable for your own health, but also for all those around you. And that's a quality of good leadership. So let's go back to the time and help the audience understand why you chose a career in medical. To give you an evolution of my thinking, this is really good, especially if I'm speaking to some of the younger Asian audience out there, maybe in their teenage years to early 20s or mid-20s, or even it can be any age bracket. Um, is to, there's a, is I, I do a lot of interviews for my college, and I, I speak with a lot of young um, students, and believe it or not, most of those are Asian applicants. And what I try to have them understand is there's a lot of times a sort of pre-formatted uh, movement of, of Asians into the medical field. And I really believe you can do this and carve your own destiny. What I mean by that 
is so when I was an undergraduate, I was a, I was a history major, and a lot of times when you you know, you think about why would you major in history? My own mother, a very passionate, very kind, and very generous Asian woman, questioned me. She says, why would you major in history? Are you going to be in, uh, a history professor? But I realized in the rest of the world that you, you don't have to have an undergraduate degree to become a physician. Most places you go from high school straight into med school. And I knew I wanted to do history because that was my passion. And it, ter- it served me very well because I've written now uh, five, six books, and I'm going on to my seventh this year. So a lot of uh, books, and I speak publicly um, almost every month, nationally, internationally. And I wouldn't have had that facility if I didn't have that undergraduate degree in history. Um, and that's really something that I, I, as Steve Jobs says in his in his um, in his dis- in his uh, uh, Stanford address, connecting the dots backwards. I never saw that, and now I see by following your heart and following your passion. You can connect the dots backwards and say, wow, that's, you know, the first step. My father was a family doctor, and he really inspired me to go into medicine. And I really didn't know if I wanted to do that. And so, you know, people always have this sort of labeled idea that you must be good in science, love science, and do these things. But I didn't like science that much. I I was more interested in art. But I knew I wanted to work with my hands and be a surgeon. So I pursued a career in head and neck surgery. Toward the end of that head and neck surgical field, uh, which I really love because of the passion of, of design, of, of excuse me, of, of technical intricacies. But when I was closing in on that, there was a gentleman, uh, Gene Tardy, that came and spoke to us about rhinoplasty, nose jobs. And what I saw was this brilliant ability to make artistic, challenging things. And, and therefore, that per- burning desire within me to be artistic was there. My, my mother then came to me and says, you're going to make people look weird, all stretched and fake, and you're not going to treat real patients anymore. And she really sees the value of what I've done now is I've carved my own destiny by following my heart because I love doing this. And I, I said to my mom, I said, remember one thing, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do exactly within the world of plastic surgery, but I'm not going to make people look weird because I really, really love what I do. So, you know, if you have good taste and you have good passion, you're going to do the right thing for the patients and you're going to do beautiful work. And so a large thing with this is what I the summary of this whole thing besides the evolution of where my career trajectory career, career trajectory is is also for those Asian uh, young adults looking for where they want you need to find your own destiny to be happy you cannot live in the shadow of your parents you cannot live in the shadow of your friends you need to figure out what's going to make you happy and drive toward that vision obviously with good peers and good support and good mentorship. Can you give the audience one example that your knowledge and your passion in history helped you carve your own path? I think the, a huge part of that is really the writing and speaking, as, as I briefly mentioned. Um, you know, I, I've written my books in a period of six weeks and two months. Um, when I write my chapters, I, on a, I don't even write them during my free time. I write them during a flight out to like San Diego next week. I have a chapter on ethnic face I've got to do. I'm, I don't take any free time because I know that when I fly out and I land, I'm pretty much either done with a chapter or I'll get it done on a flight back. So the facility of writing and public speaking and comfort with words, um, any interviews or whatever situation it is, a large part was honed from my four years in undergraduate. And it really just gave me a very broad background. A lot of physicians going forward into the medical field have a very narrow focus going forward because all they've done is biology. And I'm not saying that's wrong. If your heart and your passion is biology, by all means, do what is important to you. But for me, I really loved history in terms of understanding art, and that's opened my mind. A lot of times when you start to be creative and open, you start to have these juices that allow you to, to make things that other people don't think about. You know, what I really love is Steve Jobs is my idol in terms of his creativity and his energy to design the world around him. I mean, without, you know, the iPhone, and my life would be different. Is This is something dreamed out from a man's head, and this is something that I really believe that that creativity can be there. After your graduation and your training in head and neck surgery at mm-hmm. Columbia University, I would say most doctors would call it enough and go on with their practice. But you, on the other hand, you said you pursue a comparative postgraduate uh, fellowship in facial plastic and reconstructive surgery in New York. What motivated you to venture into the field of plastic surgery? It was a combination of uh, a practical desire as well as 
a passion and desire. The practical desire was I was looking at medicine and, and a lot of times, a lot of things insurance wise was going down this way. And I didn't want to be beholden to insurance companies. And one recollection is a, a insurance company re rejected my claim for a, a cancer reconstruction. It took a year to get paid a couple hundred dollars, and I fought it on a matter of principle. So my my world is 100% elective. So that allows me the complete discretion of basically charging to what value I feel that I'm offering rather than whatever the insurance company is going to dictate, and I get paid on the front end instead of the back end. So from a pragmatic standpoint, I pursued that because I realized it would be a viable career option. The second reason I did it was because I love it. You know, I have a colleague of mine who was doing head and neck surgery, and he was interested in going into plastic surgery, and he was doing it for the practical reason, which is, hey, I could make a lot of money, I can have autonomy, but he hated it. He didn't like the patients, he didn't like the field, he didn't like the to do anything with that. And I said, you know, you're going to do a disservice to your patients because you're, if you don't love what you do, you're not going to spend every waking hour trying to get better and doing better work. And you're also going to hate your life. And if life is too short to not enjoy it, money is not the end of everything. If you, if you have to love in a deep, passionate way what you do, because you're going to spend eight to 10 hours a day doing it. And so for me, I realized I needed that training to get better. And even after that fellowship year, I actually spent another six months in Asia um, traveling to learn about the Asian cosmetic face because I realized that that could be an impact that I could deliver as well. You jumped ahead of my next question because, I mean, you fascinated me once again because after you spend a considerable amount of time studying facial plastic reconstruction surgery in New York, and then you then you spend time studying abroad under the you know the Japanese and Korean surgeon to become masterful at plastic surgeons. I think part of it um, was a large part to do with my own mentor Ed Williams, who was my fellowship director, the one that helped me for that one year in New York. Because he said, Sam, you got to find niche markets, things that other people don't do. And so one of those things was the Asian face. And I looked at that and says, you know what? You know, if I spend another four months then or five months then, instead of doing it now, right now, if you ask me to leave half a year out of my business, there's no way I could cover my overhead. There's no way that my patients will stay with me. I would basically dissolve my practice. But back then, I didn't have a practice. So I had the liberty of, of pursuing that that postgraduate ed education and getting more education when I, I realized four months of time is not going to mean a lot in the long run so long as I do it on the front end. But the one caveat I would actually like to mention is since we're talking about just not an interview with me but advice for other people out there is a lot of people become professional students and they just spend their whole life studying and they don't go out and start making the impact. You have to make a distinction of if between how much of the, the study is going to help you pursue your career that you could have had if you didn't do it, and do it on the front end, not later on in life, if you can. And what parts are going to be excessive that are not necessarily going to be helpful to advance your career and try to get out of that. That's amazing when you said you, that you pick your niche while you're in school, because most of the doctors, they don't pick the niche. They just go on with the practice. What I thought about is that that is only one of my niches. And so over the course of the last decade, some, uh, the, pl the platform YouTube has really given me a, uh, an ability to not only, I mean, to pick one niche, but you can pick a lot of niches. For example, I do a lot of hair transplantation, um, and that's another niche that in all different ways, and you can then sub-niche that into ethnic hair transplant. Uh, Persian hair transplant, female hair transplant, eyebrow hair transplant, robotic hair transplant. Uh, I do a lot of lip corrections or people that have really overdone lips that look fake. I've actually, by learning those ethnic lip reductions and then realizing that my education fell short and I had invented better technique of doing it, that technique I could leverage and move over to start helping people that have overdone silicone lips, overdone fat grafted lips. And so that's another niche that I believe that I do more of that than anyone in the world. And so a lot of times if you just start allowing your brain to be creative and opening your mind toward uh, possibilities, you can start to see a lot of these trains of niches, what in the world of the internet is called long tail, meaning that you can, you know, if you, like if someone's searching out lip reduction or lip correction and all the videos are yours, who's the authority? Testimonial after testimonial, technique after technique, etc. So the thing about traditional concepts of business is that you can only own one idea in the consumer's mind in terms of mastery. 
Today, with the power of long tail strategies on the internet, you can own one, two, three, four, five, and be master of those things. But one thing is true, is if you're mastery of too many things, you won't be a master of anything in particular. For uh, some audience who doesn't know about long tail, so for example, let's say, rephrase that. Uh, if you talk about hair restoration, if you just pick that, that two keywords, then yes. you will compete with lots and lots of people. But we you said hair restoration for female, hair restoration for Asian, and hair yeah. restoration for Persian people, that would be your, your long tail niche. That's correct. All yes. Right. Thank That's, you. Yeah. They're very smart of you <clears throat> to uh, think about that. Those are the principal marketings, and I just really amazed that with your background in medical, but but your knowledge about marketing is really awesome. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's whatever you desire, you become. And so I have a real passion for offering my message to the world. And if you have that desire and that passion, you move toward that goal. And so I really believe in the power of intentionality. If your intention is to move from A to Z, you may never get to Z, but you're going to go to K, L, M, and O, P. But if you're over, if your intention is to go over this direction, for example, let's say it's number 10, then you're going to go this direction. So you want to know where your passion, your desire is, where you want to be in life, and then you can approach it. How was your experience of studying with the Japanese and Korean surgeons how did that experience help your career it's just stupendous that you combine the knowledge of the west and the east to create a unique proposition sure. and share with me an experience when the knowledge that you acquire from japanese and korean help you transform that patient's life yeah i i would say is one of the examples i just mentioned earlier was transforming from ethnic lip reduction okay. and being able to go into all different types of lip reduction is probably the best yeah. example but but also you know when i it's just getting you start to understand how to um, look at universal concepts of, of for example aging um, when i do the aging asian eyelid i i start to really have a cultural sensitivity to understand that the crease of the eyelid, a lot of times you see is overdone, that's way overcut, or you start cutting into a crease that doesn't exist just to take away some extra skin and you create a scar. Because we don't conceptually understand the safety limits and the cultural sensitivity that that ethnic face has. So a large part of what it's given me is a better appreciation of beauty in the East and then how to stay safe within the parameters of, of healing, and, and beauty so that that person has a really elegant result. Um, in terms of spe specificities of what I've learned from Korean and Japanese surgeons, I think when, the more people you learn techniques from, you can take, let's say a, a, a procedure takes five steps, right? Um, and I learned five steps from a Korean surgeon. I learned five steps from a Hawaiian surgeon, five steps from a Japanese surgeon. And then I learned this procedure, that procedure. You can, and then you try different procedures out. You go, well, you know what? Even though the Japanese surgeon is great and getting great results, I'm getting better results with a Korean technique. Or, you know what, in this method, I'm going to take the best of this Hawaiian surgeon, bring it into the Korean surgeon, and then transform it and create a new, new method. And so the more experience you have and the broader experience level you get, you can draw from that and then distill it and create something that I think is very favorable for a patient and put your own flavor to it. With that tremendous amount of knowledge to learn and, and train to master, can you yeah. share with the audience some of the tactics that you use to digest such a large body of knowledge? You know, I think large, the best example for me is if you think about Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, he talks about, yes, 10,000 hours, and things become intuitive. A chess player, when he is, uh, if I look at a chess board, I, won't, I will have a hard time playing it if I don't play chess, but this guy is an intuitive level. So what is very hard initially becomes very easy. A great example is when I was starting to do hair, um, Amina who works with me, she has 10 years more experience than I do. I have 12 years in hair, she has 23. When we started, I had zero. And when I was looking at people, I, she would say, this hairline looks fake. And the very initial part, I couldn't see it because my brain didn't have those 10,000 hours to start seeing what's fake. So that's a long answer to your question, which is at this point, the more you do, things that may seem complicated are exquisitely easy. Because you, you're, you're digesting an intuitive level and you're at a very accelerated rate of developing new ideas and techniques. Let's say next time when you are at the talk with medical student 
and they sure. know that there are lots of material to grasp and lots of material to memorize. What is your best technique for them? There is a book um, called a brand, I think it's called Brand New Brain or Brand New Mind. Brand New Mind. Yeah, by Daniel Pink, I believe. My cousin gave it to me in Hong Kong when I was traveling back. And what this book's thesis, uh, actually all of Daniel Pink's are, uh, books are great, but this first book of his was arguing that in today's world, the left brain person, the person that, that has to have facts and memorize things, is no longer the person in control because that's been outsourced to India. If you want, you know, you know and I can Google anything. I can take my iPhone and Google any, any information you want. What is going to succeed today is creativity and vision. So a lot of times the student is so obsessed that he's got to learn everything in the world to be great. And I can tell you, everything I learned in college, besides the idea of writing and things like that, it taught me how to think. But I don't need to learn about British history to be able to be great today. Medical school. I hate to tell you guys who are going to med school, I don't, I don't use anything I learned in med school, okay? Head and neck surgery, yes, I know the anatomy, things like that, but I use very little of it. Fellowship, even a fellowship, yes, I got the basics, but I tweaked and developed it over the years. The trick with understanding of where to push yourself in the future is open your mind to creativity. Have a vision of where you want to be and be different. Don't be the same thing. Don't get so obsessed that you have to memorize 10,000 pounds of facts because that won't give you success. Yes, you have to cross every T, dot every I, but a large part of success is defined by your ability to have a creative vision for the future. What is the first step for them to get into that kind of creativity mindset that you have? Passion. Passion. If you don't love it, you will never work to get better. It, it, money is not a driver. If you just love money, you will never spend enough hours during the day to get better. You need to love what you do. And there's a uh, psychotherapist called Cheek, uh, Michele Cheeksent Me Highly, very long name. And he talks about the concept of flow. And flow means you're so absorbed within your work environment, what you're doing that you can't think of anything else, you're in that moment. And when you get into flow, you start pushing yourself and driving yourself forward, and that's really, for me, the first start. It starts with where this is, not where this is. A lot of people try to think themselves out of it, but until this is motivated right here, it doesn't matter where this is going. When did you first open your practice, and how did you land your first patient? <laughs> uh, the, I started my practice... Uh, 11 years ago, it was, um, I actually started in my father's toilet. And what that, what I mean by that is my dad was a family doctor and I was in a small little office and it was his toilet that he took out the commode and I became my office. And, uh, my first patients were some of his patients that came through was, were, were seeing him and then some small advertisements in like the Chinese newspaper, et cetera. Um, but really that's how I started. How did you grow from that one patient? to 10 times, maybe next YouTube. 10 patients. YouTube. Oh, YouTube. YouTube? That's it. Can you tell me more about it? That's sure. interesting. December 2006, so that would have been uh, four years in practice, almost five. That was four, four years, exactly four years. So four years in practice, I was, uh, Christmas time, I was working on um, putting some videos onto YouTube, and that time, YouTube was a very early nascent technology or platform. My mother and my sister were there at Christmas saying, you are a crazy idiot. Why are you spending time putting these videos? I said, I know I have a passion for communication, and I know that I can communicate things in a simple manner that, that patients probably need this. They, they want to be explained to. A lot of physicians are so dominant up here in logic that they don't have the heart to desire to communicate. And I knew how to communicate. For example, a lot of doctors that are going to shoot YouTube videos say, you know what? It has to be two minutes long. Well, I have proven them wrong because some of my videos are 20 minutes long, 15 minutes long, because I feel like if you want to have facial cosmetic surgery or hair transplant, you want all the information it takes for me to finish the delivery, whether it's a five-minute discussion or a 10-minute. I don't stop talking until I run out of things I want to say, and then I'm done. And it could be 10 seconds, it could be 30 seconds, it could be five minutes, and sometimes I forget something and go back and say it. All unscripted, just allowing me to communicate. And using as many videos as I can to put that message out there. And a lot of people that are very logic-based go, oh, I want, to, I want to show you how to do the nose and, and all this. No, no, no one wants to see an open nose. What they want to do is understand the risks, the limitations, 
you know, what your passion is, how you do it differently, what are the safety issues, what is the aesthetic values, what, why, are, why do things go wrong, why do things go right, how things can you avoid issues, all those things. So really, communication is so critical, and YouTube was a platform for me to communicate to the world. And as you probably know, today it's the second most searched uh, uh, search engine behind Google, even way in front of Yahoo, etc. So you started YouTube since December of 2006. What was the result that you have? But I would say it's exponential. Like it's, it, it became a large part of my practice, and it still is today. Um, I, it's hard. I, I will say my business has grown 30 to 40 times over the last, you know, decade or so. There's uh, no doubt. I mean, it's been a huge, huge gain. At that time, when did you decide to expand your business in Plano? I would be very honest with you. I give a lot of uh, attribution to my mother who uh, had the vision and the faith in me at really year zero. She had purchased the property and said, this is what I want. I, I think this is going to be great for you. And I honestly didn't know if I had the, the, the chutzpah and the mind and all that to do this. But I, it's uh, actually great because she helped me build this vision and and so she was my partner in doing this but i really after a time felt this was the right decision uh, when you deal with the, the patients what are some of the emotional reason why they they are looking to do the plastic surgeons that's a great question um i would say that basically it comes from so many different uh reasons you the thing that you definitely want to uh, dis delineate and distinguish is something called body dysmorphic disorder where they're overly preoccupied by a flaw that it's very hard to see that that actually destroys their social life. That person will never be happy. But the the way the thing that I try to talk about um, to help patients understand what their motivation is and put in alignment with mine, their motivation typically is, look, I just want to look better. I don't know what it is. I see this flaw that it constantly bothers me. What I try to do is help them see my vision. My vision is, again, going back to Malcolm Gladwell as an author. He has a book called Blink. And the concept is that in our society, we're very critical of one another, how we dress, how we wear our hair, you know, how we, how we speak, our height, our weight, our skin color, our skin type, you know, our, all those things. So my goal to help a patient socially, professionally, because we all judge each other, we judge each other in a nanosecond, in a blink, as Malcolm Gladwell says, um, that I would like to convert that blink. And the way that I do that is to help them understand that, yes, here are your needs, but I want to help you understand how my needs to help you so that you get a better blink effect when other people see you. So that's a concept that I try to you know, educate them about as well. Let's say, for example, if I were your, your patient, I came to your office and say, Dr. Lamb, I need to do a no job. But according to your standard or uh, from what you saw, doing a no job may not be enough. I may do like another uh, uh, eyelid or something like that. But that's not exactly what the patient had in mind. How did you so, uh, sort of bridge the gap and convince yeah, them so that you guys can come to a point where you can agree upon? Very good question. Because I, I was at a meeting about maybe six years ago and a colleague of mine uh, said, you know, I give a patient what they need, sorry, what they want, not what they need. And I say I, give a pa I offer a patient what they need, not necessarily what they want. Um, and the reason for this is that... Uh, I really believe a patient can really look better and feel better if I can deliver what's what's there. How do I bridge that gap? It has to be hopefully within a certain category. So if you come in for a nose, I probably won't mention about your ears unless they're really obvious um, or something like that. But if I'm there, I'll first answer, I first go into very much detail of what bothers you. Make sure that I can deliver on it. Maybe I can't. And then I'll say, hey, would you mind if I gave you a global assessment? Because part of what I do is I'm in the beauty industry. I help make people look better because and I use that concept of blink. I talk about if I can make you, you know, obviously you're here to look better. And a large part of what I try to help them educate, I bridge that gap by have, having them understand is I can make you happy. But a large part of how I'm going to make you happy is by having other people look at you and give you compliments all the time. And if, if those things work for you, great. Now, th the way I phrase it is I say, look. These may not interest you. If, it, if you don't want to hear this, let's not talk about it. But if you're open to the concept, I can point a few things out that I think could help you. I can, I can work with any budget or desire. And, if it, and this is the reason I always like to start on the first day with giving them not only what they want, but what I see as a professional guidance is because 
over the long run, they may say, oh, now I can save for a chin implant. Maybe that's something I never thought about or something I didn't want to voice, but now I understand it, but I can't afford that, so maybe I'll do that in a year from now. Or, you know what, now maybe that I can see as being more important. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, waste money on, if, if the nose, let's say, is very difficult because the skin is thick, they're not going to get a great result, I'm going to tell them, you know what, I can do a good nose job for you, but it won't be amazing. You may get a better result with a chin augmentation. It'll make your nose look smaller. Oh, I never thought about that. Let's do an image. Oh, yeah, I can see that. Okay, well, that opens my brain into thinking differently. So I always try to help them understand is my impetus is to help them look better. It's not to make more money. It's not to drive them to a different end. It's to help them look better because when they look better and they're happier, I get more patience and I get happier because I've helped them look better in society. So it's just phrasing the, 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 the philosophy as a framework first. But there is risk. There is risk doing that. No doubt. So in other words, you open the path, more possibility for them to see that they can look better and, and better. Right. And of course, if they're sensitive about something and they're not really focused, then I just shut up and just do what they, if I believe I can help them, I'll stay focused. But I give that little intro question. And if they're, no, 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 I'm not really interested in the finances, then I don't continue. I focus on what they want. So besides that, people are looking up you from from YouTube. I check out your, your YouTube channels. There are thousands and thousands of people sure. were viewing your channels. So besides that channels, That's million, yeah, millions. You know. <laughs> are there yeah. any other channels that people are looking for your consultation? You're talking about video or non-video or anything? video I mean, besides yeah. YouTube. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I have. Uh, um, some social media. I don't do a lot of Facebook stuff uh, in terms of pr directly professional. Uh, you know, I do post blogs on there, but it's not been a major source of, of uh, generating revenue or uh, people coming in. It's basically SEO, SEM, you know, search engine optimization, search engine uh, marketing uh, for my websites. Uh, my face and my hair site. So that's probably my other major route of people coming in. And then I got to do a little bit of print, uh, and then the rest is obviously word of mouth. Gotcha. Do you spend majority of uh, your investment on SEO and SEM and YouTube? Yeah, that's basically the, probably the bulk of what people come to. Let's talk about a little about online negative reviews. How did you handle those things? Sure. Because I know that people, nowadays people with your reputation, people, oh. a lot of your competitors, they may do something unfavorable to you. Oh yeah, no, I've got negative reviews online. And I think one thing that's really important is to, to and I try to help my, my colleagues understand this, is that a lot of times, you know, the problem for me is that 80% of my patients can fly in any given day. Sometimes I have one a day, sometimes I have three a day. And so these people come back to me and I have been like, I have one lady says, you know, you made this lump, this, this jowl twice as big as the other during after, after a fat grab. Well, I showed her in the, in the before photo, she had that already. Well, she didn't know this because she didn't, she didn't remember herself. So you can't fix everything, but they don't, they think that you created something and almost 99% of the time it was there before they just forgot. So I, and, and the hardest thing is people that don't live here to remind them those things. Um, how I handle, uh, on, online negative reviews is that basically the number one thing is you don't internalize it, you, you know, because it's not about you. It's about it's usually some, someone that's upset, that's usually just upset at the world. Or if they're, you know, understand that, listen, I'm not a perfect surgeon. I cannot get consistently 100% perfect results. No surgeon can. And there's a good saying is if you don't have any complications, it means you've never done enough surgery. Um, but a, a large part of this is uh, to understand that you have, I have gratitude for the number of uh patients that are very happy with my work uh, and that's really what's driven me forward and just c continue to, to produce good work and not let those those elements affect you negatively you know I wonder what made you unique Dr. Lamb because there's so many plastic surgeons in Dallas you know I think part of it is is if you follow that passion let's talk about a couple things one is growth so a lot of plastic surgeons they they stay in the same status quo but they do what they learned in fellowship and make minor modifications throughout I go to about 10 to 12 meetings a year I'm going to San Diego next week this year alone I've got Brazil Bangkok uh, New York Atlanta um, Las Vegas uh, 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 Orlando um, I probably missed a few, uh, I don't know, a lot of places I'm going to this year, uh, Germany. And the, the, if you constantly learn, you will be ahead of the curve. And if you go to a lot more meetings and read more books and think about things constantly, that 
will already generate new technologies. I like, I really like what uh, uh, a patient of mine said during an interview the Dallas Morning News. Someone asked her, what procedure would you envision having in 10 years? And she said, it hasn't been invented yet. And that's a good saying because really we're constantly evolving. So going to meetings is one thing of, of looking and being creative, thinking, oh, this could change, you know, my, the way that I think, and this is going to be awesome. I got to incorporate that. And the people that don't go to meetings, they're stagnant, they're stale, they're dying. And so if I go to 10 times more meeting than my colleagues do, then I'm going to be at a much higher lead of, of, of where that is. The second thing is, is really to be passionate to want to change. Some people just are very recalcitrant, resistant to change. I'm constantly looking at, hey, will this help my field? And things are, are constantly evolving and shifting, and you have to be open to those shifts. If you're not open to those shifts, you're not going to really de deliver excellence. You know, you have to constantly change, uh, be open to change. An example is I did about four times more fat grafting um, about four years ago. And fat grafting is something I wrote a textbook on. It's what I developed a niche market on. People flew in from across the world. They still do. I just did a, a, a case for this morning, uh, you know, and I, I do a lot of fat grafts, but not, a, not as much as, not as many as it did in the past because the evolution of the micro cannula, which is a small disposable instrument that allows me to do more sophisticated fillers. And so once that cannula come up, it took in 2010, I, I took one year and so really, really ramped up my creativity of how to inject the face. And now I offer patients so many more avenues of developing facial enhancement, but still 99% of people still use needles in the face for injectables, which I feel there's a higher risk profile. It's not it have much higher bruising profile, less precision. Um, and, and why is that? Because, I mean, why, why don't they evolve? Because they don't want to take the next step to learn where they can move forward with things. So it's a passion for learning. It's getting out there and also evolving your own technique by being where you are and wanting to make those changes. To stay ahead of the competitions, I just want to recap to the audience. So you did the following. You go to a meeting to stay attuned with the, with the market. And the second thing is you got to have a strong passion that yes. you really want to, to, to yes. improve. And the third one is yeah. innovation. And the fourth one is hire really good people. My whole staff is phenomenal in terms of their creative thoughts. You're, you know... If you leadership is so important because if you lead well, you you hire great people. They work for you and they deliver that customer service, that passion, that ingenuity, that engineering that's out there. Um, I my front desk staff gets more rave reviews oftentimes than I do. My patients say, "Oh, Dr. Lamb, you're okay, but your front desk staff is great." My hair transplant co coordinator. Uh, comes up with quality control issues. She's constantly looking, hey, you know what? This thing we could tweak to get better. This thing you can tweak to get better. And she's constantly pushing these little um, things to get better. So, you know, the thing is, if, if you have a good team around you, they're also driving forward. It's not just in my mind. I have a good team that's inspired to, to create better results. Can you share with the audience some of your uh, techniques to hire a great sure. team? There's a book called Who, W-H-O, um, and it's by uh, Jeff Smart and Randy Street, and that book is a, a shorter version of the concept of top grading. And what that means is you, you, you want to ask your staff, who's the best person you ever worked with? Because they usually go, oh, yeah, it's, it's Steve. I mean, that guy was awesome. I, I wouldn't work with anyone else, but I want to work with Steve because he's awesome. And so you want to hire – and it's, this is a sad thing to say is oftentimes you don't want to hire someone that doesn't have a job. Um, you want to hire someone that already has a job and you want to pull them into a better position because that person they, they, you, you, is, is really been – you want to inspire them toward a greater position. So that's one thing. And then also you know, if your staff is happy, they'll go, yeah, I, I, I think she would be great because I'm so happy here and I think she would be happy here. But if you're creating a negative environment, which is really bad, then no one's going to join you because they can't recruit someone else. They can't say with, with looking straight in their face, say, hey – you really should work for Dr. Lamb because they may not like being here, but if they love being here, they can inspire others to be here. And when people get here, there's this general energy that's really, really positive. What is the one thing that you really, really exciting about your business today? You know, I, you know, in the last year, it's been hair transplant. It's really grown so huge in terms of the technology. And I, I've become uh, much more involved in an academic level over the last year. And I think the more academic you become, I just finished a, the, the, 
I mean, not to brag about this, but the world's largest hair transplant book, close to a thousand pages, and I, uh, with eighty chapters, I'm writing a, a fourth volume on something called FUE, which is a no incision technique. Bottom line is, the more academic, as I was mentioning earlier, the more academically you're involved, the more you're at the forefront as leadership. I, I run a run my own uh, course now for five years as course director in St. Louis. It drives you to be even better, and so I think that is one of the, the most exciting parts of my field right now that I have. What is your proudest entrepreneurial moment? Good question.、Um, my proudest moment, really, honestly, I don't know if I have one particular one.、Uh, I can't. Nothing stands out in my brain, but I would say it comes to me in small pieces、uh, almost every day. And、um, I think the proudest thing I have. Is having great staff because and and because and great staff then has great patients. I think all of those things is、uh, and the other thing I wanted to、uh, mention too is、uh, I'm my spa is being changed over to another leadership because it's been tough for my four years of, of running that place because I didn't I wasn't there as present as a leader and for me that's a failure. But I really believe that if someone hasn't failed in life. They haven't really had the opportunity to succeed, and because they haven't taken a risk in their life to succeed, and so a large part of this is my greatest moments has sometimes been failures that have brought me to my knees, but have allowed me to grow because of them. Can you share with the audience what worked and what didn't work when you grow your business? Yeah. Okay,、um, what has worked? I told you about YouTube. Uh, the other thing that has helped me was、um, really in the last year is Amina、uh, worked with me for many years and then she had to leave for personal reason came back and she just multiplied my my business by a large margin large margin、uh, so having the right people on the on the team was really important、um, and then another thing I started to think about was、uh, dividing your 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 business into what's what I call profit centers, which really means really being able to understand、um, each profitability of each sec- sector.、Uh, for example, skincare products,、um, I sell it to myself at wholesale so that I can divide out what profit am I generating strictly from my sales within my business, or and the skincare is a standalone as if I were selling it to a third party. The other thing I've been looking at is you know for me to inject fillers, I'm very fast with injecting fillers. Doesn't take me a long time, and I don't want my patients to be rushed through everything. So I have multiple rooms, and I hired a lot more staff. So initially, my fear was that's the most expensive part of my overhead is staff. So I said, well, I really shouldn't hire a lot of people. I was very, very stingy in hiring people. Now I've hired a lot of medical assistants. Patients feel the difference because they get more treatment. They have more rooms. They don't feel like they're being pushed out, and I can generate more revenue. Per unit, per unit time because I've got more more rooms. So a large part of the strategy is is and this is very specific to other、uh, cosmetic surgeons. So it's not going to really be something that probably will be universally applicable、uh, for the audience. But it just it, that creativity came from coming with you know、uh, working with my entrepreneur organization.、Um, I'm really passionate about EO entrepreneurs organization because being with these bright guys have helped me generate. Um, constantly new ideas, constantly thinking, constantly thinking and tweaking those things.、Um, the staying within your blue flame is, I think, is an important thing. For example, my spa business was not in my core philosophy.、Uh, it, if you try to do too many things, and you know what Jim Collins in his book called,、um, "How the Mighty Fail"、uh, talked about, you know, leaving something on the table. A lot of times, we try to look at every opportunity is out there and grab it. When we take too much, too many things at one time, because hey, we can make money here, we can make money here. We can't make enough. We then we lose sight of our focus, and that then everything starts to go downhill. So I would say, you know, looking at multiple revenue streams within what you do is great. Look at diversification within your portfolio if it stays within your blue flame. But once you start going outside of that, it's not going to work. The lip reduction thing was something that I basically looked at. What's called a blue ocean strategy. May have, there's a you know book to that effect, which book to that title, which is idea of creating something that no one else does. I know that's hard to really conceptualize, but when you create a blue ocean strategy, which is easy to talk about but hard to really find, look for those opportunities because when you create a blue ocean strategy, there is no competition. There's no one else that does it. The other thing that's important is not to commoditize your work. 
Um, for example, Botox. Everyone looks at this, they look at Botox as a loss leader. In other words, I will give it almost for free out there. No, I'm going to deliver a better result. A great example is a lady just this last week that was going to give me, she, she came to me with a spa certificate from my spa for $400. She says, you know what? I usually get Botox in my own office and I, and can you, can you take care of me for 400? I said, no, I'm going to be a little couple hundred dollars more. She said, really? That's really expensive. I don't want to pay that for Botox. I said, well, you know what? Try me. I want to deliver value for you. So in two rounds for a couple hundred dollars more than she usually spends in her own office, I, she walked through the door and I was blown away. She looked amazing. So in front of my staff, I said, Hey, you've done, uh, excuse me, four years of Botox in your office. You've done two times with me, six months. I said, how many compliments have you been receiving? She says all the time. I said, do you see the va You see value? I didn't, I don't commoditize my Botox. I don't try to go low end with this. I try to have patients understand. And how do I reinforce this? Through the stories I'm telling. Stories in this book, Made to Stick by Chip and Dan Heath, talks about using stories to communicate. And I really use a story to have you understand value because it's, and that's the thing is don't commoditize your work. Make sure that patients understand it. Make sure they're educated about your difference. You want to show them, but you want to verbalize it so that they understand this when they're thinking about a competitor to go somewhere else. The best way is just to educate. Absolutely. Them. Education, education. I see the three things that should be better with what I deliver. Better education, a better experience, which means friendlier staff, which means uh, you know less pain. It means um, hopefully less bruising and manage that, and then better results. And those are the three things that I'm always focused on during um, any patient encounter. What makes that? cost you the most my money. Spa. <laughs> Not staying within my blue flame. Uh, that cost me millions. And uh, it's a big disaster in terms of where I was in, in choice of that. But, you know, this is the thing is, a couple things are important is, there's, you know, the theory of sunk cost. A lot of people say, well, I spent this much money, I can't let it go now. Right. Sure you can, because if you don't, you're going to continue to lose money. You, ne you need to just forget your losses. A lot of people get, they so get so focused on the past and their mistakes you got to learn from your mistakes, move forward from them, and not dwell on the past. The past is gone. You know, don't tell yourself a story about the past is gone. And I need to, I need to focus and focus and focus on the things that deliver return, and not focus on everything out there. The other thing that's important along those lines is really, in my opinion, the, the misconception of the idea of value add. So we so focus on the idea that, oh, I've got to do this for value add. For example, oh, I need to have in my wellness building a uh, massage therapist. No, you don't. I have found that that doesn't necessarily translate. Yes, they give me business. There's no doubt I get referrals. But we get so obsessed with that that we lose business because we're not focused on our blue flame and we're losing revenue over here even though they send some referrals over. Not enough to justify another business. Let someone else run their blue flame. If they love what they do and they spend 24-7 doing it, how do you compete against that? You can't. You've got to focus on your skill sets and what makes you good. When you mentioned about the misconception yes. about value added, yes. at what point do you know that, hey, I just lose sight of it? I knew, uh, unfortunately, a long enough time ago, but my mother, and I don't want to blame her for this, is very passionate about keeping it open for the value add. And mm -hmm. I respect my mother a lot. She has been my business partner for a long time. And it took me a while for her to understand that, look, this is not a business, this is a business proposition. Sometimes we tag emotion to everything. Emotion, emotion, emotion. Now, there's a difference between passion, which drives you, and blind emotion that holds you back. And we hold on to things because we're emotionally attached to them. That can kill us. Businesses, and I hate to say this, you know, for example, firing someone. There's a good saying, you, you never regret firing someone. Because the, 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 I have never regretted firing someone, I can tell you that. Because the only thing I regret is not firing them sooner. They, they, they are a cancer. They can be a cancer on an organization. If there's enough justification to fire someone, it's going to happen. Because you've got to look at your organization as a ship. And if that cancer is on your ship, it's going to eat it and destroy it and sink it. You've got to drive your ship forward at all costs. Because without that, you're going to – and you think about as a leader, you're going to have so many mouths to feed. And if one person is causing a destruction to the rest of the, of the staff, then that is going to destroy the entire everything. And there will be no more patients, no more mouths to feed, and your organization is going to close. So you've got to look at the, the, the health of the organization. Now, that's not an excuse for treating staff poorly, but it's understanding 
that you have to look at the the the, the big picture right. for the long term. Can you share with the audience one of your personal habits that you believe contribute to your success? Um, I think a lot of things there, but I would say one is uh, my faith in God, uh, because a large part is that I don't worry anymore. You know, a lot of people sit at night worrying about their future, and I have enough money. You know, will I find uh, a perfect love in my life? Will I have you know three perfect children? Will I have this? Um, I really in my heart of hearts, believe that there's a divine providence, whatever it is, and I don't question it. If things are not perfect in my life, um, like Steve Jobs talks about connecting the dots backwards, that you see, oh my goodness, this is what God's plan was for me. So I, I really believe um, in a higher power uh, giving us that blessing. That's the first thing. The second thing I, I uh, believe strongly about is having accountability with a, a person that is there. For example, um, some of my goal sets for this year are, number one, to be a good chef. So every week I, I have to cook something and I have to send an email on Monday night that I cook something at least once a week, if not more. I want to work out four times a week um, and I have to work out four times a week. If I haven't worked out four times a week, I, I, that's accountability. I send it over to my, my accountability partner every Monday. I'm working on what's called key performance indicators, looking at financial financials and trying to figure that out. I haven't got that done yet. I'm, it's going to take an eight-week process to get all that done, but I'm looking at that as a weekly metric as well. So accountability partners are very, very important in my opinion. Um, and really just having time for yourself. A lot of people don't give themselves that time. They, they work so long and so hard that they don't have time to creatively move forward. If you're constantly like this, like a wheel, like this, you're not going to be able to have enough energy to propel yourself forward. The other thing that's important for me, what I've done, is I've created a, a one word. Okay, so this is the thing that I, I learned about in a book called One Word. Um, and I, it's an, a part of this thing for my organization in EO. I generated this concept is, I didn't generate the concept, excuse me, I delivered it to my, my forum brothers. And one word is, Defi help yourself to find one word that will be your focus for the year, okay? My word last year was believe. Believe in God, believe in faith. Allow myself not to, you know, for focus on myself as much, but uh, have, have trust. This year's word is healthy, okay? Healthy, for me, it means four levels of health. It means body health, means workout, eat right, um, sleep long enough, don't stress as much. Um, emotional health, it means look for what I want in life. I'm single. I'm looking for the perfect mate. So I want to put myself in a pure position where I want to have the right person. As intentionality, as I was saying, is so important. Mental mental health means not living your life with disease in your head and, and putting yourself in a position where you're constantly arguing against yourself, hurting yourself. I went to a Tony Robbins event last year that was transformative called Date with Destiny. It's six years I'm sorry, six weeks. Felt like six years. Six, six days locked. Six days locked in, all day and night, 12, 14 hours, amazing. It's talking about changing your stories about yourself and your past so that you don't lie to yourself that, hey, I'm not good enough because of blank, because of a past relationship, because of a past failure. No, that has nothing to do with you today. Um, and, and then spiritual health, which means, you know, for me is attending church on a weekly basis, praying on a daily basis, um, uh, opening my heart to God, opening my heart to, to, to love, opening my heart to everything. So healthy is the word for me. And, and so if you have that intentionality, remember intentionality, that means not beating yourself down. It doesn't mean that if, hey, I ate something wrong or I didn't go to church this week or I didn't do something right, that I'm going to beat myself over my head. That's not healthy. That's unhealthy. So a large part of this is the one word exercise, I think is a cool exercise because it allows you to focus on where your intention is and stay true to it the whole year to the best of your ability and have accountability partners to work with you to get to that end. Do you have an internet resource like Evernote that you in love with and, it, and you would like to share with our listeners? Uh, like I do use Evernote to write notes when I'm, uh, but I don't think that's a huge one. Uh, ah, good question. I don't know. I use everything on my iPhone. I will say... Maybe some apps or uh, you know, some of the, the tools that you I, use. I'm going to just throw out some random stuff. Uh, Nike Training Club, you know, which is a high-intensity interval training. It's a free app. 
Um, and what it is is like when I go travel, a lot of times you got to figure out how am I going to work out. And, you know, getting on an elliptical machine and not really getting your heart rate up is, in my opinion, not as going to be building your whole body. And so these HIIT workouts are free. You just click the button. You pick if you want to get lean, get fit, get whatever. You just click on that. That's very helpful. Okay? So I, I, do, I think that's a great app. I use Siri all the time on my iPhone. I should, it sounds like I'm publicizing uh, Apple. Yes, I'm Apple stock, but that's not why I'm doing it. And I'll just say, remind me uh, tomorrow night to do something at 9.30, and the reminder will come up. And I go, oh, yeah. Or when I get home, remind me to do this. So I constantly put reminders there so that I remember to do things because I usually forget um, to do something. I, I take notes on, the, on like the um, – like uh, I have a list of things that I want to do, a list of things I got to purchase, a list of whatever. I have all those things on the Reminders app. Um, Dr. Lam, if you could recommend one book to your listeners. 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell, unequivocally so. I think uh, Asians out there need to be leaders in the, in the industry, and leaders in the field. And leadership, I like the idea that we all can be leaders. Leaders lead leaders. In other words... I don't want to have followers that are just going to be blindly following me. I want them to lead other people. And, and, and that allows me to have even less need to delegate and do things because it generates a chain of leadership. Maxwell defines principles of leadership. Right now I'm listening to um, – I'm sorry. You only want to want. That's it. 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, John Maxwell. So Success Nation, if you haven't already, you can get the audio version of this book and or any book you want by, for free by going to AsianSuccessBook.com. Dr. Lam, the next question is, the last one, is it kind of doozy. Imagine that you woke up tomorrow morning in a brand new world, identical to Earth, but you knew yes. no one. You still have all the experience and the knowledge you currently have. Your food and shelters were already taken care of. All you have is a laptop and five hundred dollars. Okay. What would you do in the next seven days? <laughs> so I have a laptop, five hundred dollars on another planet. You know, obviously, as I told you, I have faith in God, and wherever I am, I would first open a prayer to to find out what the best direction is, because a lot of times uh, divine providence is a lot power, much more powerful than our own creative energies. So humble yourself to to that divine uh, power and say, hey. Listen, I help me with this. I think that's sometimes the most important thing to start with. Um, beyond that is to open your heart with love and, 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 and opportunity and, because a mindset and tension is so important. If your mindset is fear and trepidation and negativity, it's going to be terrible. Um, and then really at that point, um, I hope the laptop's a Mac because I like Macs, but that's all right. That's another bias. I think you've already heard my bias here. Um, <laughs> I, I would say that um, a large part, I guess, are you asking what I would do? I, if I have all my skill sets then, I would go out and uh, conquer the world again. Because if you look at, if you look at um, people out there right now like Donald Trump, or maybe it's not a great example, but a you know, lot of successful people, I was listening to this guy Peter Thomas, um, you know, they go through bankruptcy and everything has failed. And in a way, what you described is bankruptcy. OK, in a way you can look at you can interpret your words as bankruptcy. Now, fortunately, I have not gone through bankruptcy. I failed. I haven't gone through bankruptcy. And the goal with bankruptcy is to take those skill sets. And if you have those skill sets and nothing's been taken from you, you can start over and go for it. And I really believe the laptop, the Internet's most powerful form of communication. And I would start shooting videos and communicating with the world about what you have and why you're different. Dr. Lamb, how do you want to be remembered? That's a great question. We, I just did this exercise uh, with my um, EO guys. You know, they, we pretended a plane crashed and destroyed you. And uh, do, you know, do you know the story? I'm sorry to do a quick blip. We have a second? We have, do, you, do, you know, do you know the story of, no, uh, of Alfred Nobel? Of Alfred Nobel, what, happened, what he was famous for in his life? Or, you know, so, he, uh, I think he made right. TNT, so right? Do you know about his obituary? So you know about his obituary? So, no. Okay, so what happened was he was sitting there in, in Paris reading his obituary. And he, he says, well, I'm not dead. Why am I reading this? And in his obituary, he said he made TNT, dynamite. Very few people know that. And it destroyed the world. And, he's, and he says, what happened? He actually, it was his brother's obituary. But they mistook it and had, it was, wrote it was his. So a large part is that they want to change his legacy. He wanted to change his entire legacy. 
And he says, I want it. Now people, really very few people, I'm like, I mean, you're an exception, don't even know that he invented TNT. They just know that he basically uh, changed the world for peace, right? So the things that I, I would, um, if I die tomorrow, for example, what I would want to be remembered for are the follows, as follows. And this is what's driving my intentionality for 2014 because I don't have a wife or family yet and it's one of my major passions I want to go for. But I would like um, someone to say he was a faithful man of God, that he loved his family, he had beautiful children, that he changed the world through passion. Um, something that I'm passionate about is ending world slavery. I know that's not, it may not happen. There's 27 million enslaved people in the world. I would love for people out there to not be, not have their civil liberties stripped from them. And that's a huge passion of mine. So I really believe that um, those are the things I would want to be remembered for. And hopefully that I've made the people out there more, um, more confident about who they are, uh, more beautiful in their own way and let their beauty shine. Because a lot of times emotionally we're beautiful, but as the, as age or other things take it away from us, we lose that self-confidence. And my goal is, is hopefully to be remembered for helping people look more beautiful in this world and therefore feeling more confident and feeling greater so that they're more empowered to do the things they want to do. And I really hope that I've also um, fed a lot of families in, 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 uh, in terms of uh, my business and, and um, uh, uh, give enough gave a lot of employment to people so that they can in turn go out and change the world as well.